I want to welcome everybody to something to talk about today. It's the inclusion study group, and we're going to be talking about mentoring, uh, being a mentor, having a mentor, and Anne Lovejoy, bless her heart, is going to uh, get us online with that in just a minute. But I do want to first say that uh, something to talk about is sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone is offering innovative and compassionate care. They're on Rolling Bay and they are now accepting residents. If you'd like to tour their beautifully appointed apartments, call them. The number 360-271-2530. And Anne, thank you so much for organizing this. And uh, we're grateful that you're able to be here today and uh, sort of facilitate this conversation. Well, thank you, Reed, and thank you, everybody, for showing up, especially the panel members. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, some of them have not made it here yet, but hopefully will appear at, like cameo guest stars as we roll along, right? So today we are mirroring the dream as the Inclusion Study Group celebrates uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy by exploring our experiences in being mentored in activism mentoring in turn, and the many ways we can step forward to work for social change and restorative justice at all ages and stages of life. And special thanks to our wonderful panelists for agreeing to be part of this sure to be rich discussion. Uh, I was, I've been privileged to be part of the organizing committee for the island's annual community celebration of the life work and legacy of Dr. King, along with all the panelists who are supposed to be here and those who are here today. Um, and when we were meeting in peace in person one day, this was obviously a few months ago, we were talking about Dr. King and other local inspiring mentors. And it turned out that almost everybody at the table had been influenced in their path to activism and social justice work by Dr. Frank Kitamoto, an island legend, legend who helped bring so many important issues to the community's awareness, including mentoring Akuye Karen Vargas, who was inspired by Frank and has mentored so many other people in turn. Um, and it seemed like a perfect opportunity to gather some of those stories and look further down those paths to ask not only who mentored you and how did those influences shape your work, but also who in turn have you inspired and who are you mentoring now? Um, before we get to the questions, I would like to introduce our panelists, starting off with Karen Akuye Vargas, even though I don't think she's here yet. But Reed, maybe you could put up that little screenshot. Um, Karen yesterday was awarded the Governor's Luminary Award for Arts and Humanities for outstanding work with underserved people, especially her Living Arts Cultural Heritage Center and Living Life Leadership Youth Mentoring. And you just covered up my notes. <laughs> I don't know how to get out of this. Okay, maybe stop that read so we can get back to. There we go, thank you. Um, I made, because I'm not feeling super well and thought I might have COVID, I made extensive notes in case I space out, which I clearly just did. So, um, so Karen founded the Living Arts Cultural Heritage Center and the Living Life Leadership Youth Mentoring Programs, which have been running for years. Um, she, Karen has exhibited <laughs> years and years and years, decades of passionate advocacy for Kids Have Kids and Bainbridge Kids and so many more. And I'm really honored to say that Akuya has been a major influence on my own equity path and conversations with her several years ago led directly to the Senior Center's Inclusion Study Group, among other things. We were standing outside the thrift shop talking about Dr. King's legacy and said, I said, we need to talk about this. And she said, we do. So do something about it, girl. <laughs> I was like, Okay, so here we all are. <laughs> Another panelist uh, who is here is Ken Matsudara, uh, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts Director of Community and Cultural Programs. Ken is a fourth generation Islander with a deep background in art, mu museum curating and cultural studies and a lo long history of interest in social justice praxis. And maybe he will tell us a little more about that. He's been a lifelong student of Japanese American history and has a fabulous collection of family stories about Uncle Frank, among others, that bring local history to life. Uh, Katie Curtis, Education Outreach Manager for the Bainbridge Island Historic Museum. Um, Katie has a passion for fostering 
cross-cultural knowledge and understanding. And it's well reflected in all her work for the museum in facilitating history and education programs and building community outreach partnerships with teachers, local schools, and cultural organizations like the Senior Center. And she's presented many of those programs here for us, um, for which we're very grateful. Debbie Hasi, after <laughs> is an amazing woman. After careers in systems engineering, she co-founded and taught at Madrona Waldorf School for many years, and then became a facilitator for the Compassionate Listening Project, um, and has worked in Israel and Palestine, among other places, at, as, in the Deep South. These days, she facilitates healing circles and is dedicated to anti-racism racism work, merging compassionate listening with white people's inner work of unpacking racial conditioning. She's also involved with cross-racial collaboration, activism, anti-racism workshops, and supporting cultural events. Um, Chastity Malatesta was going to be with us today, but she had a scheduling change and is not going to unless she suddenly pops in. And if she does, that would be awesome. So maybe we'll start out. I'd love to hear from all of you about who are some important local mentors in your life. I think we all look to great, amazing, iconic figures like Dr. King, but there are also local people who have been extremely influential. Um, Ken, I know you have some great Uncle Frank stories. Do you want to share some of that? Sure. I mean, one of one of the things I, I really just remember and, and loved about Uncle Frank was just his, his gentleness, his way of being in the world. Um, he could be very, very almost soft-spoken sometimes, um, but there was always a fierceness to his dedication and to his, his commitment to making the world a better place, changing systems of, of, of inequality, um, and, and using his positionality to, to really focus messages of, of change. Um, and, you know, I... I just, I, I always loved his, his chuckle, um, his, his way of, of, of just, um, even when he was really kind of you know, upset about things um, or angry about things, you wouldn't really, you didn't necessarily, uh, it didn't necessarily register as, as, as anger per se. It was more like, you know, game on. He, he would get his, his game his game face on and, and get get a little serious, but that, that humor and that warmth never never left him. Um, even when when uh, involved with with you know big struggles. Um, as, as far as stories, I mean, one of the ones I, some of the some of the very f uh, few stories about about camp that I would I would hear. Um, the internment camps, um, most of them, most of the ones that I would hear from, from my parents or from, from other community members were, they were usually kind of, you know, on the fun side or whatever. Um, and never really so much about the, the kinds of hardships that, that people went through. But I remember one of Uncle Frank's stories, which I guess in retrospect is kind of weird and kind of funny too, but um, he, he talks about one of his friends and, and, and Frank must have been very, very young at that time. Um, one of his friends playing um, and he, uh, on a tire swing or something like that. And my, my uh, Frank and my other uncle Hiro were, were with him. And this kid somehow got the rope wrapped around his neck and he was just, ah. um, and Fr Frank said, I mean, and Frank and Hero both are just kind of like, oh yeah. And then remember we had to run and we had to grab the knife from, from the from the inside and we came and we cut him down really quick. And that, and so even even in, in the most kind of horrifying situations, Uncle Frank would would always still be be approaching them with, with humor and and um kind of a lightheartedness. Um, and that's something I, I really really admire and, and and hope that that I'm able to to also tap into in my adulthood and my activism um yeah I, I and I, I miss him greatly thanks Ken I, Katie do you want to say a bit because I know you and Frank had a lot of history too 
Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having this. This is an honor to be here. I am sorry. I am going to walk around a little bit here because um, I ended up having to um, cover at the museum today. And I wanted to share, let's see, what my uh, computer has, um, which is Let's see if I can get my, so let's see if I can get it here. I don't know if you can see it. Everybody see Frank there? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so that is Frank and um, I'm sitting next to him and we are down in uh, California and Frank and um, would go on only what we can carry uh, which was an organization that took uh, teachers and survivors down to Manzanar to learn the stories of, of the survivors. And he would come down with us at, um, the years that we went down there. And um, it was just an incredible honor to get to know him. And something about, it's hard to, it is hard to describe him. I love the way you did that, Ken. There's, um, just the laughter, the lightness, the earnesty, the, um, but then there is that fierceness, you know, that he would have. And as, as a mentor, I mean, I just remember going um, to his celebration of life and how the, um, the nieces and nephews would say, oh, I was his favorite nephew. I was his favorite niece. And I just felt the same kind of way. It's like, oh, I was his favorite like Mac member. You know? He just was one of those people that made you kind of feel that way, that you were special and he believed in you. And that was one thing is, one thing he'd say is, you know, that the Japanese, Bainbridge Japanese American story, um, it's not, a Japanese American story, it's an American story. And he was talking about really those deeper issues of um, uh, everybody knowing kind of like he just was everybody's cheerleader, like everybody knowing how they do have importance and they do have, can make a difference, really can make a difference. And so um, I met Frank um, because I was invited to the Multicultural Advisory Council and he had started that council. And um, he was one of those people who really uh, made me feel like I belonged. He was really, really good at that. And so that's what I have to say about Frank. And of course, I have lots to say about Akuye too. But I think if anyone wants to add into their Frank stories, that would be great. Actually, I was going to say when I was talking to Sharon, Sharon Kitamoto, Frank's wife, she said, uh, you know, Frank always wasn't, wasn't always like that. Um, he wasn't always super outspoken and a connector, but he was greatly influenced, interestingly enough, by a series of programs put on by his dental association, where they would have speakers like, um, especially he, I guess, was really affected by Dr. Um, Rachel Naomi Remen, the author of Kitchen Table Wisdom and My Grandfather's Blessings, if some of you have read those amazing books. But she really had very strong ideas about being in the service of life or being in service to fuller life. And apparently that was a huge key for him. And I'm thinking about how, for a lot of us, um, that the most important mentors have been warm uh, people who made us feel seen, heard, and capable of con contributing, right? Like waking up our own sense of like, well, what do we have to offer to this? And I thought that was fascinating that the, uh, uh, he just, you know, wasn't, didn't come out of the egg that way necessarily, but he grew into that role as we all kind of do. Um, Debbie, I know you would probably say that Akuye Karen is one of your most powerful uh, mentors and influences. Do you want to say a bit about that? Yeah, and that, that was an interesting segue. We said like, what, 
what can I do here? And Akuye, for me, was that welcoming. The her well, I mean, we all know her, and her welcoming spirit that made me feel like I belong, or maybe I have a place in this. I mean, I'm way newer to this race equity work than a lot of you, but I feel like I belong because of the the arms she wrapped around me in bringing me in, and she always talks about bringing people, bringing folks in. And the way that she, you know, hi family, right? Every, every meeting she starts with hi family. And it took me a while to realize that she really means that, you know, like we're really her family. And that's really inspiring to me to have that sense of, you know, just being, having a place that it's worth, that I'm worthwhile to contribute in, even when I don't feel like I have all that much to offer sometimes. And what I so appreciate about her is her message of, around unity and all being in this together. And even when there's rifts in the race equity community, she's not willing to cast anybody out. And, and it's like, we are all still in this. I will not take a side, you know, whatever. That, that value of unity is, I don't know, I just, it's so important. And I just carry it in my heart and with so much gratitude for her. And also, she doesn't always use, she, I don't even hear her use the word love very much. Maybe, maybe I'm not listening, but she embodies that, that, that great mother love is where, the way I think about it and, and brings love and unity into the work in a way that is so heartening. Certainly, I'll stop that's, there. That's, yeah. Thank you, Debbie. That's yeah. And you made me think of one of my favorite Karen stories was, uh, I think last summer there was a march in Bremerton and Karen, of course, was marching along with the sign and some younger hecklers were standing by the side of the bridge yelling and had waving. And I think they all had guns. Yes, they did. And Karen went over and said, well, hi there. What are you doing? I'm just curious why you'd show up at a peace march with a gun. I mean, just, you know, curious here in her amazing warm way. And first they were sort of blustering and she said, I know guns, I've carried guns. I've been in the military, I've served. And she got into this whole dialogue with them about what they were doing there. And uh, <laughs> later a woman showed up at one of the Kitsap Erase equity meetings and it was a Zoom meeting. So she Zoomed on and said, is that Karen person here? And I don't remember, maybe do you remember if she was there or not? But, but the girl said, you know, my mom wanted me to come on here and tell y'all that the young man whose name escapes me, like Jason, has never listened to anybody in his whole life, but he was really impressed by Karen. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it's that heart of that heart to heart. Like she is unfailingly open and warm. And Frank was like that, unfailingly open and warm. And I think it's so interesting because we often think that to be a good mentor or a good leader, we have to be passionate and even maybe stern and angry. And maybe some of that's a hangover from the 60s when being angry was all the rage um, about social injustice. And there's, God knows, plenty to be angry about. But I'm really struck by this theme of warmth and connection and openness and building community and think about Dr. King's beautiful community, right? How do we build the beautiful community? And when you think about the mentoring part, I'm curious about how you feel mentoring being carried out in your life now. And maybe Ken, we can circle back to you a little bit. Sure. Um, for me, um, one of the one of the big mentors in my life was uh, Gail Tremblay. She was an instructor for me um, at uh, the Evergreen State College, um, and just taught me so much about not only art and making and and um, what goes into to creating a message through art, but but also just different ways of being in the world um, and, and how one can, can just 
be so dedicated to, to changing things and, and facing injustices, even, you know, even as their body is failing around them. Um, and um, for me, she's just been, been such an inspiration. Um, and, and really what I learned from her was one of the best ways to mentor is just give people permission to do what they're gonna do. You know, um, she never really told me what to what how, how to make art <laughs> or to or at the start. Um, she just said make, um, and um, made space for me to, to to explore and create things, um, and uh, gave me encouragement, gave me great feedback whenever I would make pieces or or give performances. Um, so it, it it's something that that. That, that I've really embraced, um, that, that really the, it, that, that a mentor isn't a manager. Uh, a mentor is just somebody who is there to, to give different perspectives sometimes, or just to say like, wow, that's amazing. You've blown my mind. Um, or uh, here is something I think that you should do. You're ready, um, try it. Um, so with, with my personal mentoring, um, one, one of the, the folks who I'm very, very uh, happy to have been working with is uh, um, an emerging artist named Myron Curry. Um, Myron, uh, I met through uh, my work at Seattle Central and Myron was a, was a, a, um, a re-entry student. So he had, been, he had been incarcerated and was coming back to school. Um, and um, in the three years, maybe four years that I've known him since he's, and, and he really didn't have any artistic training. He was mostly self-taught. Um, when he came in, I, I saw some of his work and was just blown away um, by the level of talent. And um, in three years time, he's gone from, from having no artistic experience at all to uh, being on the Washington State Arts, um, uh, Washington State Arts panel, I cannot remember what the, the full name of it is, but it's the, the uh, organization that does public art for all of the schools and, and takes the 1% the for, for art funds and finds um, uh, artists to, to work with them. Um, He's been on this. He's been uh, he he. If you've been in Seattle and have seen the uh, those wonderful murals on the new building that's on Twenty Third and Union, that's his work. Um, if if I could share a screen for just a second, um, I, I can scroll through a little bit of his of his work as well because I, I love I love talking about him. <laughs> um, he's really amazing, um, and, and um, he's he is gaining so much traction. Um, and, uh, where are we? Give me one second here. Yes, this one, and I want, where, ah, sorry, there. Uh, this is Myron's work. So he is, and this is Myron right here, the, the one in black and white, and was a, this was actually a, a uh, painting that he did while while incarcerated. Um, his the the themes of of strength and 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 inspiration that run through his work are just amazing. Um, and uh, you you won't find a more a more wonderful guy. Here he is, right here. Um, so I've just been really, really happy to be to be a part of of his mentoring, as well as um, with so many other um, so many other mental uh, folks who I've had the privilege of of mentoring throughout the years. Um, you know, uh, for me, ju just I mean, having having students come back. Uh, and, and running into them while they're in the 30s and, and saying, hey, I, I just wanted to let you know that, that maybe I didn't listen to you then, but, but man, <laughs> you've been an influence. Um, it's just, I, I don't know, it's, it's humbling, you know? Um, it makes me feel like I've, I've 
uh, I did a little bit of paying back um, for all the, the wonderful privileges and, and gifts that I've been given throughout life. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, that's great, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, I think humbling is a perfect word because when I think <laughs> you're right, like a mentor is not a manager. It's not a director of your, uh, <laughs> of your life, but it is someone who is a powerful influence and so often someone who helps build who you are, helps you build who you are in the world um, and not take credit for it, <laughs> which... <laughs> sadly can be kind of a, a feature of some of the mentoring relationships. Um, so this is beautiful. Uh, Katie, do you want to speak to that a little too? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I feel like I just have so many mentors and I can't really think of anybody specifically uh, that I, I'm a mentor for. But what's interesting is when I was on the Multicultural Advisory Council, um, I met Chastity and um, it, was, it was as if we kind of had a, uh, I, like a connection of we understood each other just right away, that kind of magical, like I was talking and she was understanding my strange way of seeing things or talking or something. And she would like put wind in my sails kind of. And then, you know, come to learn that when she was coming to the Multicultural Advisory Council meeting and, and, and considering joining and things like that, that she really appreciated what the way I would say the way I would frame things, you know, the context that I would put things in. And um, so I feel like we're co-mentoring each other kind of, but I do, the only reason I might say it's a mentor, you know, mentorship is I'm so proud of her work in the community. And um, I just, I feel like she's just blossomed all over the, the, island and uh, picked up the, you know, just the soil, the meaning, the, I, um, you know, the earth here is, you know, been walked on by the Suquamish tribe for, um, you know, since time immemorial. And one of the things that comes through as a value from the Suquamish tribe is welcoming people you know um there's abundance here and so we are that grateful that we can welcome people and um i just feel like for all the wonderful um things that she brings she's like a native bainbridge islander so it's just a fun fun relationship you know so that's that's the person that comes to mind and I do want to just do a shout out to uh, one of my mentors. Um, her name is Edith Ng. She's not an Islander, but she happens to have a friend who's on the island and loves Bainbridge. Um, but I worked for, with her for years at UC Berkeley in the Staff Affirmative Action Office. And like mentors were talking about, um, I made so many blunders as the, you know, uh, person who was well-meaning, but would step all into stuff and think that I had the idea that everybody should listen to and all that stuff. And she was a great mentor in that way that she walked me along not caring what stage I was in or not, you know, I mean, not judging that there were stages, but just carrying me along. And um, I also just have to shout out to Barbara Lawrence, who is um, a Su Suquamish tribal member who also uh, just, it's, it's walking side by side in a way where um, there's so much humility um, and uh, willingness to trust that that things can grow, a flir that a flourishing can happen. So, oh, wonderful. Those 
see, I don't know about the rest of you, but to me, this is just inspiring listening to this. Like, and one of the pieces that comes up for me over and over is that, you know, what do we think mentoring is? And how do we maybe mentor others without even knowing it? I'm going to ask Debbie about this because when I asked her to be on this panel, she said, oh, I don't think I mentor anybody. And I'm like, are you kidding? Um, because for me, I think part of, you know, putting on programs as Katie does, as Debbie does, facilitating circles, you're doing this healing work of modeling how things can be done in a different way. And I feel like that is an important piece of mentoring that maybe doesn't get the spotlight as much as making big national speeches, but it's really important in everyday life. Can, do you feel like you could say a little about that yourself? Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting when you, I had to think about this for days because you looked at me like, I, when I looked at you like, I don't mentor anybody. And you looked at me like I was like not getting something. And so I've thought about mentorship because in my mind, it's a one on, it's been a one, you know, I think about it as a one on one. And for me, or more explicit, or I have thought about it. And I think what I'm realizing, given your inquiry, was that, or is that, that modeling is how I learn and experience is how I learn. And, and that's what I see when I work with a Kuye and with chastity. I'm just watching them all the time and learning. And, and then also like Peggy Erickson and Aaron Leidick. And I'm just, I just learned so much by, by the modeling. And I realized that maybe I do that too. <laughs> In fact, once Chastity told me, I forget what it was, it was some meeting and then also a board meeting, and she talked about how, and it feels awkward to say this, but about myself, but how my presence changed the energy in the room. And I had, and until you started talking about mentoring, I would not have thought about that as a way of mentoring, but it's a I don't know. That's that's a piece of it, I guess, is how one shows up. And and if I try to show up in a place of love, maybe it'll have an impact. And um and what I learned, what I keep learning so much is in Kitsap Erase, Kitsap Equity Race and Community Engagement, is that the mentorship comes in as a collective. Like, I feel like I'm constantly learning from everybody. I believe so strongly in the wisdom of a circle. So I facilitate a lot of different types of circles. But in Ketsepi Race, there's a collaboration, a non-hierarchical uh, you know, non way of being that moves at the pace of relationship. And I'm receiving the greatest mentorship from that. And then also exchanging it. It's like mentorship upon mentorship that's that's happens in a circle or in a coalition um so that's one way and also as you can see i'm a white-bodied woman that is constantly trying to unpack my biases and my privilege and my sense of white supremacy and and because i'm constantly doing that i help other white folks do that by by facilitating co-facilitating workshops or series of workshops through the Compassionate Listening Project that bring white folks into unpacking their racial conditioning. And, and I guess by being really vulnerable and exposing all of my embarrassments, <laughs> that's a way of mentoring too. So I, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at with it. I think there's a beautiful point that being vulnerable ourselves gives not only opens other people's hearts. Like truth is always an opener. You'll see that in, you know, that's why peer support is so incredibly valuable when somebody really is walking the same path or similar path and really understands. And that piece of mentoring, I don't think gets a lot of, uh, of attention or getting called out a lot, but it's actually very strong. And, and one of the pieces I think uh, too is the, again, the humility and the warmth. I mean, when you were working in uh, Palestine and Israel, how did that connect? How did you reach out to people? 
well, I was with the compassion on a delegation with the compassionate listening project. And it's really listening with the intention of seeing the full humanity of another person. And that person can be very different than myself. And, and it still can happen. You can see, can see the humanity in another being, even with very different views. And not, I'm not talking about condoning anybody's behavior or agreeing. Um, I forgot what your question was, but I'm going off on a tangent. No, um, do it. It's great. Go. And um, what it, you know, some people disagree with listening to people who are like maybe outrageous and like listening to going to the Confederacy in Alabama and, and listening to people who are running, still running that Confederacy and by listening and being open and having the group energy of compassion, people shift, things shift. It's amazing without really even speaking much, but by listening and allowing somebody to be seen for who they are. Um, yeah, that's where I want to go with that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I find that really moving. And it's like Karen on the bridge with those hecklers, right? Yeah, and I had somebody on the same bridge. That's, I think it was the same thing. There was a man with a Confederate flag. And I thought, I'm going to practice compassionate listening. And I went to go talk to him. And I did, had no idea what I was going to say. But I, would, I asked him, well, can you tell me about your flag? And people are looking at me like, what is she doing? But um, he started explaining part of compassionate listening is listening for values. And I was trying to tune into what he valued. And he talked about how he was from the South and how there were people weren't friendly here. And I said, it sounds like you're really lonely, you know, and, and that you value community. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And he started expressing his loneliness and his, his fear. And he was a young man in this new place. And um, he asked me about my sign. And by the end, his Confederate flag, it was huge, was rolled up behind his back. And he asked me, well, what is this? Building bridges, not walls, anyhow. And I said, well, it's what you and I are doing right now. For me, that's what it is. And he's like, okay. And he walked and I said, why did you come here? And he said, because I just want it to be like a nuisance. I'm like, well, how come you're not right now? And he said, well, because I talked to that person there and I'm talking to you here. And, you know, I don't feel like being that way. And so. Yeah, what a powerful, powerful story. And right, <laughs> I love you and Karen on that bridge. Just. <laughs> it was I the same, I think the same march on the man at bridge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's just such an amazing outreach. Um, Robin, Robin Hunt, are you here? You were interested in saying yes. a few things about, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I too am a beneficiary of Karen uh, Akuya, Karen Vargas's mentoring um, over many years. We worked, we're working together on many, many projects. But um, since I may be one of the older people <laughs> responding, I wanted to um, recall some of the islands and communities more historic mentors who are no longer with us, who are very important, were mentors to me uh, way, way back. One was Walt Woodward, you all know his story, but um, and Don Nakata and uh, Al Colvin, Reverend Don Mayer, who was the pastor of Eagle Harbor Congregational Church, okay. and Junko Hurui. Um, and Rabbi Scott Sperling, um, and Gina Corpus, whose name was Gina Vicente at the time. And you've heard me talk before back in 91, when the white supremacists um, targeted the island as a laboratory to get rid of all the non-whites. Um, then Mayor Sam Granado appointed Gina and me to head a task force to figure out how to repel them and what to, you know, what to do about this. And so uh, Junko was one of our was interesting. He was our what I would call his silent leader. You know, he he is the one that came up with a statement that was put in the newspaper, the centerfold of the review that said, 
um, a strike against one is a strike against all of us. You know, basically, don't you uh, try to separate our community? So he was in a quiet way, but when he spoke, he had such wonderful things to say. Well, Woodward was mentoring me quietly behind the scenes based on his experience as editor of the review with the Japanese internment, that he was very much supportive of our task force trying to repel the white supremacists. And he would give, you know, I'd go talk with him on the sly and just, you know, um, get, get his input. Um, Al Colvin, not from the island, his daughter lived, Carolyn lived on the island, and he was the first black um, Bremerton City Councilman. He was almost also a former Tuskegee Airman. He was a very important mentor to me when I was first running for the court, introducing to me and also for his the rest of his, his life. Um, and Lillian Walker, also of, of Bremerton, who was um, featured in a, as a state uh, oral history as a pioneer, a civil rights pioneer for the Pacific Northwest. And she uh, started raising racial issues in Bremerton and protesting businesses that were closed to blacks in the early 40s, you know, way be before Martin Luther King um, had a dream and had his march or before Rosa Parks um, refused to sit in the back of the bus. And one of the things that I remember that, she, that her attitude was, and this is kind this is like mirrors or presages Karen's or Akuya's, that she said she she didn't have malice towards people. She said, they just don't have a clue. They're not educated. It's our job to educate you know, them and let, tell them another way. And then she got so much accomplished. Lillian got so much accomplished with that persistent standing up um, for the right way to do things, even though it wasn't quick and easy. Uh, and Karen has been a master, Akia has been a master of that for, for many, many years. So has um, Gina Corpus, who has been uh, in, uh, in investigating and researching the Indipino history for quite some years and then trying to bring it to public attention and now has finally achieved the this terrific documentary everybody has seen. But that, that too is a slow, courageous, sometimes painful um, process. And, it, and so some of these people... Um, uh, and there's some other uh, uh, current uh, uh, people that I would just mention too, who aren't out there yelling and screaming. We can march, but not. But they're the people who inspire and get things to move and make change, systemic change that we talk about, because that takes hard, sometimes painful, um, incremental work. And I just would uh, mention. Um, uh, Kimi Kinoshita, who's um, involved with the Senior Center, all, and Blodell, I can't remember all the things she's involved with. And she is a very um, good at persuading people to reach the right or the appropriate or universally kind of right conclusion on their own. She doesn't ram it down their throats. She just has a way of, uh, of words with that. Chastity Malatesta that you have mentioned, same sort of uh, uh, approach. Um, Marsha Cutting on behalf of the um, disabled people, very, very similar steady work. She works with the state for this disabled. And Eve, if you are still on the, the line, I want to give a, a shout out to you for your leadership and opening people's minds and hearts to um, different types of gender issues. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, and I remember one time when you said, if you have questions, just come talk to you, because before that, I just thought, yikes, I would like to talk to you, but I didn't quite know what to say, but your openness and warmth and genuineness has made such a difference. You have done a tremendous job educating and changing the attitude of people uh, in our, our community, so anyway, that's a big, long um, list, I, you know, I just wanted to just mention a few, and um, especially some of the um, older people, but all of these people that we've mentioned before, and, and uh, Kuyu in particular, um, have generated what I call uh, disciples. After you've been mentored for a while, you can then go out in the world and um, on your own, it's like the, the, pot, the pebble in the pond spreading and, and, and doing some other work independently. So it has a multiplier effect of benefit to the community. So, sorry, you talked too long. Okay. Oh, that's great, Robin, thank you. And I guess I would call out Rob Gelder, our, one of our com county commissioners as someone who's been extremely 
as a gay man uh, standing up for rights of every kind and really a, a, a strong public figure. Uh, but, but when you talked about educating, I, that reminded me of um, Bernice King, Dr. King's daughter said recently, and has said before, we need to educate, advocate, and activate for social, economic, and ecological justice. Yeah, and how do we wanna go about doing that today? And I guess I'm gonna ask each of you in turn, like what would you recommend for people wanting to get more involved with social justice work locally? And Ken, I'm gonna circle back to you again, if that's okay. Ken, you're muted. Um, one of the best things that th I think that one of the best things that people can do is just realize that they have power. That um, <clears throat> that individually, every one of us has practically every one of us has has agency and and has privilege in certain areas, and these areas can be leveraged to to support um, and. Uh, um, be part of, of struggles. Um, I, I, you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that, that uh, it's also important to, to be parts of communities um, and maybe even communities that you're not familiar with. Uh, and when, when approaching communities that you're maybe not familiar with to, to come in with, with again, humbleness and openness and, and just a, a sense of 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 that that beginner's mind in men, in many aspects. Um, change isn't made um, by individuals alone. I mean, certainly individuals contribute and can lead and and such. But it's it's behind Dr. King there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were also struggling for it, uh, for realizing the dream. Um, and uh, I think that it's really important that that um, you know, that that we we understand where our positionality within communities um, and what that means. Um, and I, I believe that that um, when you are when you do have privilege. You're, and you come from from populations of privilege. That um, it's really imperative that you are actively part of the struggle to for justice in these areas where you do have privilege. Um, yeah, you know, for, for the the obvious one, of course, is for 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 race, for example. Um, if it was up to uh, BIPOC folks. Racism would have been, if it was you know, within our power directly to end it, would have been taken care of a long time ago. Um, and even though it looks, it, but, but still, it seems like it is put upon BIPOC populations to do the, the expectation is that, that we do the heavy lifting, right? But really the systemic changes are gonna be coming from folks who have privilege with it, uh, race privilege. Um, even if you know, even if they they feel like, well, they do not have economic privilege. There's still tons of things that 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 they can do with uh, folks who share their privilege to start changing and shifting minds. Um, I think that the the work that you that that folks are doing with uh, on the island, um, the anti-racist work that you are doing on the, the folks are doing on the island is, is, is great. Um, you know, yes, there, there's a lot of things that, 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 um, that uh, BIFOC folks are involved with, but I, I feel like the, the inroads are coming from, from work like that, that Debbie is doing, that Anne is doing, that, that, that uh, Katie you're doing that 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 are that are talking to to um, white people and affluent folks on the island um, and, and slowly or getting the, the conversation to shift. Katie, this seems like this is something you can speak to too, because of course you're doing a lot of educating um, in one way or another. Well, 
I would say uh, it's great to, um, like, I just love Robin's list of people and know, know your history and go ahead and, you know, get to know who Frank is, get to know more. If you get to meet, you know, Akuye, I hope all of you know her, but if you don't just, you know, walk up to her because she's willing to walk up to you and um, get uh, engaged in some way or another. I love the way that uh, Ken said, maybe join a group that you aren't a part of. And that made me think of how um, funny it is that there are it's all about context, but sometimes I will say I am part of BIJAC, the Japanese American community, because the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community is also an organization, and I am, you know, on the board there. And um, I remember very vividly, very sweetly talking to Frank and saying, is that the wrong thing to say? And he just laughed, and he was like, no, you're part of our community, you know? And so I think that those, um, you know, it's like our brains, they need to organize things and generalize about things and put things in certain places just so we can think. Um, uh, but actually, the areas are, are fluid, you know. And um, so that's one thing I'd say. I, I I uh, think that there are, um, you know, incredible people on the island that are working really hard, like yourself, and and I I feel like um, just take the time rather than, I mean, I don't want to be critical, but I'm thinking of my own family rather than hashing out stuff that you hear on the news. Just walk out your door or click on a Zoom link and be part of a group you now that's moving things forward. I want to uplift what you said, Ken, about basically white folks doing, you know, having the privilege and doing the work. And there are lots of opportunities on the island to do that. And so I don't know if I have it in me to put, to list all those here, but I'll put my email in there because we really are looking for more white folks to come off the sidelines and help. Um, as simple as Speaking at a board meeting, huge need for that at the in the Baybridge Island School District. Anyhow, there's lots of you know little steps or big leaps are welcome. Oh, thank you. We are in the process of trying to get done by about two o'clock here at the museum of installing a community art piece. Um, It'll be in the orientation gallery downstairs, um, right by the reception desk. And what we're asking people to do is come in and contribute to this installation, um, Community Mirroring the Dream. And um, show the commitment to, to the legacy of Dr. King's work um, by either placing stickers around a central piece um, in each each uh, sticker uh, indicating a different kind of commitment, what you're willing to do in your own practice um, for, uh, to, to further the cause of social justice. You know, for example, are you, are you willing to commit to, to um, staying with the work when it gets hard <laughs> um, and, and uh, just uncomfortable? Are you willing to, can you pledge to, to offer regular financial support to organizations that are doing uh, social justice work? Um, are you, can you commit to doing the internal work of recognizing your own biases, um, et cetera? And we're also asking people to share, um, to write down um, responses to uh, what is it that makes you feel seen? And what is it that makes you feel unseen? And all of these elements, get combined onto the walls um, to create a, a continually, continually evolving uh, document um, and uh, encourage people to, to, to visually join community and be part of building something beautiful within a community. So uh, I look forward to seeing you at the event. It will run through, through let's see, uh, 
the, the Monday following next, so the 24th, I believe, um, is the date on that. 